Well, it's lovely to be sort of here, and I'm very, very grateful uh, to both the chaplain and the provost for um, inviting me to join virtually, if not virtuously, with you, with you um, this uh, Evensong, and particularly to be among uh, your, uh, apart from a present company, starry speakers this, this term. Um, it's just so sad that I can't actually be with you, but I'm very looking for, very much looking forward to perhaps uh, having a conversation uh, virtually at the um, uh, sherry, whatever you call it, afterwards. Um, but there's another sad thing I want to just reflect on to start with, and which is one of the saddest aspects of our current times, I think, is that we tend to thrive on conflict. Now, I don't only mean the sort of endless political polarization um, and conflict there, but the sort of framing, the insistence uh, that everything uh, is deliberately twisted into some form of warfare, um, even when it isn't. Um, even the pandemic, doesn't it, becomes a war on a virus. I sometimes feel we need more voices like that of the old US senator who a few years ago, when asked whether he was with the Hawks or the Doves um, in regard to an area of international conflict, responded that, you know, it's not so much the Hawks or Doves that we need in Senate, it's the, it's the lamentable shortage of owls from which we suffer. Wisdom for our time. So it is, by the way, with um, our question for this evening. Uh, the uh, questions around science and religion, or science and Christian faith in particular, have been framed as conflictual um, for at least 100, 150 years, maybe, or more. Um, it turns out <laughs> that, like some of our invented conflicts today, um, this uh, framing stems from a few late 19th century uh, polemics, um, such as Andrew White's book, uh, a history of the warfare of science with theology in Christendom. Now, these aren't much read apart from historians of science by now, but his history uh, is largely um, invented. Yet we've inherited uh, this conflictual interpretation. How, I'm asked, yeah, do I reconcile my science with my Christian faith? And yet, if they were really compatible, and someone like me, been both a Christian and a scientist, also professionally been a professor of physics and a, a, a lay reader in the Anglican Church for, for many years, would, would feel that conflict tearing them apart from top to toe. But I also know, and many others in my position do, that science feels like a vocation within the kingdom of God to those who follow Christ. The question is how does it feel like that? Why does it feel like that? What's, if you like, the purpose of science as a gift within the kingdom of God? That sounds like a much more fruitful question than how do you reconcile the conflict between science and Christian faith? Another thing that's of hallmarks, or rather hallmarks by its absence, the voluminous literature on science and, and, and faith, some of it very good, um, is an absence of a really close reading of biblical material and scripture. So we can ask, where do we start in the Bible at a moment of conflict, when arguments have reached fever pitch? when everyone's opinion is intransigent and accusations have become bitter. It turns out that that moment is halfway through the book of Job. It's Job 28. It's where we are in this evening's readings. Job, for a scientist or indeed for a poet, is the outstanding document of the Old Testament, arguably the whole, the whole Bible. It's certainly the richest biblical poetry. But I remember reading it again as a very young Christian and, and a, a young scientist, um, immediately falling in love with the saturation into nature that this book represents. Job 
Job's argument is, is, is often framed as a sort of um, a, 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 a theodicy. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a question, why am I as a righteous human being suffering? But reading the book, it's, it's even more than that. It's, it's asking why does nature look so chaotic, wild, thunderous, lightning, floods, um, meaningless bits of life, flesh that rots on my bones. It's asking about the chaotic, apparent lack of control of nature on the wild side and how God could reconcile that with creation and justice. And Job's so-called friends have a brittle and superficial theology and they have been arguing uh, that this could only have happened to him, all his suffering could only have happened to him as a result of his own sin. Nature behaves like a sort of slot machine that pays you back. Job knows that that's not true. And we know later that God vindicates that knowledge but when the arguments have got nowhere other than gridlock, a new voice enters and it takes us down a mine. As we heard, did you hear the lovely lines? There is a mine for silver, a place where gold is refined, iron taken from the earth. We descend the shaft with the miner and see the earth transformed by fire as um, as, as underneath its surface. Did you pick up uh, that the poet then points out that this inner, this ability to see the earth's inner structure is distinctly human. It does not belong even to the king of beasts and not even the hawk with her sharp eyes sees any further than the superficial layer of the top of the earth. No, only the human sees the structure of the veins of metal and jewels underneath the earth. I have to say, for me, this is my favorite metaphor for science. Any scientist will recognize this poetic description of what it means to deploy the scientific imagination and to peer beneath the appearance of things into their inner structure. Uh, it turns out there are medieval and early modern contemplations which resonate with this over and over again great scientists like um, Robert Boyle and great medieval scientists and philosophers like Robert Grosstest have very similar ways of marvelling at this gift of special sight. Moreover, this special sight is called wisdom. See how the, uh, the, 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 the chapter slowly confesses that all this mind shaft metaphor is really about a search for wisdom and it's rather amusing isn't it you go to the bottom of the the, the, the sea the deeps the deeps say it's not in me the sea says not with me uh, and then the search goes into economics into the market um, as uh, job scholar carol newsom points out uh, the, 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 the passage about the gold or crystal, the coral or jasper, contains six different Hebrew words for gold. And if wisdom had been found there, it would have been. But it can't be bought with pure gold. And at the end of the poem, the hymn to wisdom, it's called the whole chapter. And thank you for reading it all through with me. Um, we find the search. The search for wisdom finds its end for God understands the way to it. God alone, verse 23, knows where it dwells. Why? For he views the end of the earth and sees everything under the heavens when he established the force of the wind. And then he measures his creation, measures out the waters. He decrees a path for the rain and the thunderstorm so the chaos is contained. More metaphors for science. It's 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 a, a resonance of the first one. It's this almost X-ray vision into creation, but it becomes quantified and measured. Ah, now I always have to say, <laughs> I always thought that um, again as a young scientist that, that science can't have been quite as new um, as the history books told me it was. And sure enough, just as there is an ancient Greek root uh, to science here. 
in the book of Job, we're looking at the ancient Semitic, the ancient Hebrew roots for the scientific impetus, the urge. If you like, this is the tributary of the river that we now term science. But you see, this is really shocking because those last verses imply that the insight into creation that God has, when partnered with the echo and resonance of the first about the minor, is the very insight that human beings, even human beings that go down mine shafts, are expected to possess and deploy. Now this um, insight into nature in the context of pain and questioning, this deployment of wisdom um, in a, 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 a questioning and suffering predicament has huge resonances in the New Testament as well. It's picked up in uh, Paul. We heard, didn't we, in our New Testament reading, uh, in his great exposition of the good news in, in the letter to the Romans, right at the heart of that letter. It's, it's, it's the passage which bridges between the famous statement um, that now the spirit of life has freed us from death and the consequent statement that nothing can separate us from the love of God, not suffering or death or nothing. But to get from one to the other, the bridge is this groaning of creation, the anguish of incomprehension before creation. All creation groans, writes Paul. And he later expands on that, actually, to the, to the Corinthians, when he's describing our universal vocation as the ministry of reconciliation. From there, I wonder if we're beginning to see, in the long line of the biblical story, insofar as it explicitly talks of our relationship with creation, what a vocation to share in God's insight into that material world might be. Some of that ministry of reconciliation is between people. But like Job, why should not some of our vocations of reconciliation be with the rest of nature, the non-human creation itself? And if that is so, in the same way that political science or ability might be seen as God's gift to those whose vocation it is to reconcile people with people or nation with nation, might not science be seen, imagined as a gift to God's people, to the church in particular, to the world, in order to perform that other ministry of reconciliation that takes us from a position of incomprehension, perhaps fear, uh, perhaps propensity to hurt nature, into one marked by wisdom and knowledge, and where fear um, is replaced by wisdom and harm replaced by flourishing. Amen.